Manifesto, episode one with Ben V and Dr. G. We are recording from Malafe Studios, recording studios in Washington Heights, New York, and 159th Street. Shout out to Javier, our sound engineer. Par for course, tell the audience about you, Dr. G. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, which is most of you who are listening, um, I'm a Functional medicine, functional neurology, chiropractic practitioner in New York City. Um, I have a, a pretty unique type of practice where I attract people who have uh, anything from brain-based complications or uh, brain-based disorders. I have patients who are suffering from autoimmune disease or metabolic disorders. And of course, we have all kinds, everything in between. But I think what's more interesting to people is how you and I got, got together. Ben, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so my name is Ben Velasquez. And uh, let's see, uh, Dr. G and I met about, I would say, four years ago. And uh, we met because Dr. G was doing a fellowship in neurology in Atlanta. And I decided that it was important that I take a couple of courses in this particular <clears throat> in this particular school relative to concussions and what my interest was uh, when it shifted to concussions from performance rehabilitation. So Dr. G and I met there. We had a mutual interest in concussions, uh, him on the functional medicine side, me on the mechanical side, and we kind of hit it off and we've been working together since. Um, but Dr. G, tell, us a, tell the audience a little bit about what functional medicine is. Sure. Uh, and what you were saying the fellowship that we were that I was in at that time four years ago was actually in neurochemistry. Uh, so just a little more background. So I graduated in 1996. I, I can't believe that's over 20 years ago. But um, right after I graduated, I was lucky enough to get uh, accepted into a postgraduate neurology program that took about three years to complete. And uh, once I graduated from there, my practice was really centered on understanding the brain. Everything from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's to children with developmental disorders like autism. And then over the years, we started to see a lot more traumatic brain injury, especially with uh, it, you know issues related to the military um, and, and in sports, of course. So it was that... Uh, type of work that got me interested in functional medicine because invariably when we saw somebody with a brain-based complication, there was always some kind of an organic or visceral dysfunction, some kind of a gut problem. And then, of course, over the years in the early 2000s, the research was coming out pretty pretty quickly on the, the gut-brain connection. And that's what we were studying back in 2011 when you and I first met. And uh, what was so interesting about meeting you is that you come from a background that's completely, uh, you were, out of the 300 people in that room, there was nobody with your background. Um, your background in, in training and, and professional sports and, and uh, working with high-level athletes, wor working with, you know, the, the weekend warrior, working with the, you know, the mom that's looking to get, become, mm -hmm. become an athlete again after she's had a couple of kids and, and over 40. You have a very unique background, and, and you are seeing a lot of high-level athletes experiencing concussion and and bringing in some of your techniques in there so um, I think that connection is why we started to refer to each other and then create this relationship yeah it's uh, yeah it was very serendipitous I mean uh, my background is is a little different as you said uh, my undergraduate degree is in uh, aeronautical science basically aeronautical engineering and uh, after working in the field for a couple of months, I was completely uninterested in staying in that field. But I'm glad that that was what I studied in school because it's helped me quite a bit in my career. 
Um, I played uh, baseball at a pretty high level and always liked training, always liked the gym, always liked the athletic preparation portion of it. So I went back to school and uh, studied physiology and I worked in corporate fitness for about three years and um, kind of quickly ran through that pipeline and realized that I wanted to work in pro sports. So uh, I initially thought about going back and getting my master's, but I quickly realized something that's important. It's important to both Dr. G and I. It's important, should be important to the audience um, that um, I got some good advice that in the world of strength and conditioning, and I think that now that's kind of spilled over into a lot of other professions, um, especially when it comes to performance, which is what we're ultimately going to talk about, uh, the academic side of it or the university side of it I found was typically one to two Olympic cycles behind what the best coaches in the world were doing so I made the decision to go and intern with some of the most successful strength and conditioning coaches and track and field coaches um, in the world and I traveled the world for a couple of years interning with uh, some some very very uh, uh, prestigious and accomplished uh, coaches, um, you know, everyone from Charles Poliquin to Mel Siff to, you know, uh, to Pierre Waugh to, uh, um, I can name a dozen, um, and I traveled, you know, all around the world, and uh, that's where I got the best experience, and I started working in pro sports, I started in hockey, even though I grew up in the South Bronx and I knew zero about hockey. <laughs> Um, so, and I'm Puerto yeah. Rican and yeah. it's about baseball and boxing. So I had to actually learn the game, but it was great. I used to travel, uh, I used to go out once a month to uh, Saskatchewan, which is uh, in Western Canada for the audience who doesn't know Saskatchewan. Um, the joke is that if, you're, uh, if your dog gets lost, uh, you can still see him three days later because it's like cold and flat, right? Um, or if your dog runs away, rather. Um, so... Uh, from that, I worked in more traditional athletic preparation and strength and conditioning for a while, and I was fortunate to work with some very, very good athletic programs like the University of Texas uh, track and field I, and uh, some very good teams and started working with individual athletes. And about uh, a little over three years ago when the whole concussion crisis became you know, frontline news in the media, I started looking at the athletes that I was seeing for orthopedic injuries and, uh, and athletic preparation. And I realized that when I polled them or I evaluated them, up to 80% had had at least one concussion. So um, I wanted to take a deep dive into this and see what, what the mechanical role was, um, what role the engineering of the body played in um, in either mitigating the risk factor or rehabbing an athlete that was coming back from a concussion and uh, started really doing some research and Dr. G and I met and I'm very happy that we did because we'll speak a lot more about the biochemical components uh, of a concussion or of a traumatic brain injury and how they relate to the rehab process and, and here we are today. You know, I, I was just laughing when you mentioned uh, growing up in the South Bronx, being Puerto Rican and, and you know, being exposed to hockey. I think, uh, you know, probably since 1950 to today, there's probably a maximum total of about three Puerto Ricans in the South Bronx that ever even saw a hockey stick. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, too. And you know what? Uh, I guess with the advent of the of the internet, you know, the the fan base has grown a lot bigger, but I still think it's the attraction is because of the fights. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it it it's the gladiator games, you know, in in just a different <laughs> form. But uh, you know, it what's really interesting about our relationship is that it started with referral back and forth with uh, these athletes and you know, in, in when 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 you learn what we learn, people are coming at at you with you know, brain-based uh, or neurologically mediated or biomechanical complaints that may not be related to concussion, you know? And and that's where you and I, we, we, we share patients that are, you know, having metabolic disease. We share patients who have uh, degenerative neurological disorders. Um, we share patients who have diabetes. I mean, it's not just about concussion, but we're using these same principles, which is why we're doing this show. You know, if, if you look at if you look at medical science and research and how we talk about it in society, 
you know, it's like you have to have a stamp put on your forehead of a of a disease condition you have, whether it be post concussion syndrome or Alzheimer's or diabetes, and that's the way our, our our practitioners and our doctors are kind of divided in their specialties. And 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 what we're seeing is that these are metabolic problems. So many of the interventions you and I do with most of our patients can apply across a spectrum of disorders, right? Oh, no doubt. I yeah, mean, no doubt. They from, all have a biochemical component. They all uh, have a mechanical component or associated with movement in some fashion. Um, and the rehab process has to be, the idea is that it's global. And I think that's what that's Dr. It. G is saying. And I think that, you know, medicine today is incredibly myopic and I know that a lot of people are talking about this and incredibly specialized, but I don't think that the general population realizes how, how, what kind of, sh how shorted they're mm -hmm. getting when they get a view like that, um, and and how important it is to look at everything globally. When uh, when you and I started traveling around the country and lecturing to different groups of doctors. Uh, you and I both fully expected that we were going to get referrals from those doctors of complicated cases to us, and we do. We get people who come in, they fly into New York, they see us um, at your facility and or my facility. Um, we're both in Manhattan, so we're, you know, we, we actually started working in the same facility more, more often. But um, I, I would say that the, the, the people that are, be, that are referring to us, the doctors that are referring to us, they're actually referring themselves to us. Yeah. They they want to improve their performance. They want to know how can I take these principles that apply to concussion. Now you know maybe I didn't have a concussion, but you know I'm not the athlete I was, or I, I'm not functioning at a level that I was, or I'm experiencing brain fog late in the afternoon, or uh, some type of of concern or complaint. People always want to you know kind of beat the clock and 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 stay young. And I think that you know what you and I talk about when we do our program is really about performance. It's about and the disorders that we see is just about raising their level of performance. But if we have somebody who's totally healthy, you know, doing great, they too can increase their performance. Absolutely. And it's a relative term. I mean, uh, too many times performance is interpreted simply uh, as athletic performance. And that's not what we're here to talk about. We're talking about optimal human performance and you know uh, whether you're a recreational athlete that likes to get after it on the weekends or a pro athlete who's getting paid to participate in a sport or just a guy or a lady that you know want to you know the 16 hours that you're awake you want to be functioning at a high level um, there's there's a ton of information out there now available to you at your fingertips, but it's very hard to decipher it, and it's very hard to put it together. Um, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to, to help you to be your own advocate. Right. That that that's a really important point because now information is everywhere. There is no. In, it used to be that the people with the information had had the keys, you know, to to the kingdom, and they 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 would command the. Uh, you know, kind of the their their fee for making that information available. But now information is, to use a big word, ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, there's too much of it. And I think what we're going to do here, the reason why we're putting this show together, and we you know we we plan to make this an, an ongoing podcast, and we love the name. Uh, that we created for ourselves, right? The uh, oh yeah, we need uh, to explain that because the that's a mouthful. Manifesto. Be but before we explain it, mm -hmm. the the point that I wanted to make was, you know, the information is everywhere. Now it's a matter of interpretation, right? How do you interpret? I mean, we see this in the news media. We see this everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's you know, you put on the six o'clock news, they give you five minutes of what the news is, and then fifty five minutes of their opinion about it. Yeah. And and unfortunately, that's the reality that we have. Information is easily accessible. It comes from anywhere. It comes from the Twitter sphere or the blogosphere. But now we need to look at the validity. We need to have an opinion about it. What does it mean to us? And I hope that, that we can create a show where we can decipher a lot of that for you. So we're going to be reviewing books. We're going to be reviewing articles, research. We're going to be looking at products that people are using. And let me tell you, we're going to be talking about things we're doing to ourselves. There, mm -hmm. There's very few things I would ever tell one of my patients to do 
that I haven't done myself. That's a really good point. I learned that early on in my career, Dr. G, is that, you know, and this was from a person that um, was one of my mentors. He's like, um, I don't understand the notion of a weak strength and conditioning coach. And, uh, you know, I took that to heart. And um, even to this day, I don't prescribe anything that I haven't participated in myself um, or that I haven't seen some at least anecdotal results in my practice. And uh, I think that's really, really important in today's <clears throat> in today's uh, space because not only do we have this exponential amount of information that's multiplying, you know, second by second, but it's either trendy um, and what's fashionable now, or it's way too scientific and at 50,000 feet. So we need to bring that down to mm -hmm. 10,000 feet for the audience and, and, and also make sure that we stay away from what's fashionable. I want to expand a little bit on, on, on your history, too. I mean, if you walk in, into Ben's office, there's a, a photo. There are photos up there, a lot of photos of names and people and autographs and people that Ben has either worked with or, or has, has you know, contact with. But there's one picture. There's this one photo of a guy who's shredded. I mean, this guy looks like an Adonis, just what you would think you know, a perfect mixture of, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and... Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't go and, that and, uh, Mike, Oh, my God. And Michael Jordan in his prime. <laughs> and that picture is of Ben Velasquez uh, doing a, a pose uh, for his all-natural bodybuilding contest that he's won. So he's, he's definitely participated in the strength and conditioning field, uh, you know, with, with, with hands-on. But also... What I love about your history is that when you said you traveled the world to work with these coaches, you actually got to travel to Cuba and work with some of the uh, coaches there in, in boxing. And the reason why that's important is we have to remember there was a time when we, you know, you and I are both children of the 80s. We, we grew up in a time when, when the Soviet Union and the United States were the two mega powers. <clears throat> the Cold War. And the Cold War, they talk about the Iron Curtain. The Iron mm -hmm. Curtain was not just an Iron Curtain around countries from the east and the west of Europe. Mm -hmm. The Iron Curtain was, was technological. The Iron Curtain was, was philosophical. I mean, Medical. the Iron Curtain came down big. And the research we were doing here in the U.S. on fitness, performance, medicine, was just very different from the directions that they were going and the scientists and the doctors and the researchers weren't communicating. Yeah. So there are techniques from the Eastern Bloc that were, you know, very, very um, different from what were, were being used here for the athletes. And we know how the Soviet Union performed in the Olympics and in hockey and in boxing. Mm -hmm. And in Cuba, you know, now that Cuba is opening up, um, there's word now that some of the big bo boxers are paying these uh, coaches that, that live there to come here and start coaching boxing because the techniques are just totally different. And talk about a sport with concussions. I mean, if you know, they're using principles there that we've never seen here and you had firsthand exposure to that. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I'm fortunate that I speak Spanish, number one. And number two is that, you know, I was advised by... Uh, someone that I worked with to try to hook up with coaches that were educated in that Cold War Eastern Bloc era because uh, their focus was basically military and sports. And they put all of their money into the military and to sports. And, you know, sometimes the best, re the, the best research is a, func is a function of how much funding you have. So when you have countries like that that are putting an enormous amount of money into studying anything that improves athletic performance, then um, they were way ahead of us when it came um, to things that we're learning about now. I mean, um, not just, you know, uh, relative to concussions and sports like contact sports like boxing, but, you know, just things that are becoming popular now, like cryotherapy. I mean, the Russians and the Cubans studied that ages ago. Mm -hmm. What, you know, what cold shock therapy did to your performance, what heat shock therapy did to your performance. So, you know, being fortunate enough to speak Spanish and work with some of these coaches, I was able to kind of peel away the fat and say, oh, wow, this is these, this is why they're getting results. And how can I apply that to my practice? And how can I apply that to 
um, what I'm doing with my athletes. And something as what seems benign, but is that it, it's incredibly important, is um, how these guys used to warm up. I mean, just the warm up. And that applies to everyone, whether you're going to, um, you know, uh, Equinox, uh, you know, two, three days a week, or you're a high level professional athlete, you know, how you warm up in the gym dictates a lot. Um, that's going to have an effect on your results and your ability to mitigate injuries and your ability to get to be efficient with your training um, and the way that they warmed up. I mean, I work with some professional teams and, you know, they're clueless when it comes to warming up. So things like that is, is are very, very important. And we'll try to bring it down to a level where the audience can actually uh, benefit from some of this information. Well, there, there's a, um, you know, kind of a story of 2016, I think, is that, you know, whatever is up was is now down, whatever's left is now right, and, mm -hmm. I mean, everything's turned on its head. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you this, um, the world of science, health, medicine, is is not immune to that. Um, you know, what, what, we're, what was also not uh, the same in the last, you know, 50, 60 years between the East and the West is our understanding of nutrition. And, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's being turned on its head. Uh, for 50 years in this country, the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, the federal government, the agricultural uh, department, the FDA, I mean, everybody, schools, um, you name the organization that, that drives public policy, and they've been wrong on almost everything as it relates to nutrition. 100% wrong. I mean, it, uh, their ideas about unsaturated and saturated fats, their ideas about meat and, and their ideas about protein. I mean, literally, almost everything has been debunked. And uh, there is just some amazing research being done on this. It's not, this is out, this is no longer opinion. Um, the world of research... Uh, you know, as it relates to nutritional advice that's been coming down to the American people, I mean, it has been debunked to the point where the, the science is being called junk science. Um, I, I could point to a, a wonderful book that I read very recently called The Big Fat Surprise, and it's, of course, about uh, eating fat. But Nina Teichholz, who, who wrote that book, she is a Harvard and, and I believe Columbia trained uh, medical journalist, all the credentials you would need to decipher medical research uh, in, in, in a way that she could be critical of, of it. She went back to the late 1800s and everything since then on everything that has to do with nutrition. She went to the archives and actually got into the notes, handwritten notes of the researchers and dissected every study. It took her 10 years wow. to write, to write this impressive. book. And basically, it's flipped everything on its head to the point where the former head of the American Heart Association fully endorses her book um, and, and the research behind it. It's a 500-page book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it'll blow your mind. And, and there are all these people out there trying to have low-fat milk and trying to do the right thing and, mm. and, and you know, having vegetable oils and, you well, know, going well, vegan. Well, didn't the uh, New York Times come out with that article talking about how it was recent, and they talked about how the uh, sugar industry paid the scientists under the table to basically, um, you know, uh, what's the word, to um, villainize uh, fat. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Uh, they were paid to villainize fat, and um, I mean, like, something like, some a ridiculous low number like fifty thousand dollars or something <laughs> and yeah like nothing and so the sugar industry and in, since the early 1950s you know has been working on promoting a low-fat diet because the substitute is sugar and you know and high fructose corn syrup is is in everything right right Right. And that's something that you, you, the audience might be interested in because people don't realize that. They don't realize what it's in. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, just foods that you're too, you just assume, you know, I, I should have a bowl of oatmeal or I, I should have my, my Cheerios because it's heart healthy. And I mean, this is it's it's complete. It's based on complete nonsense. And, 
you know, it, it's funny because, like I said, everything is being turned upside down. This idea that breakfast is the most important meal of the day um, is also being turned on, on its head. Damn, and, I like breakfast, Dr. G. I I know. <laughs> I like breakfast, man. And, so. and what we eat for breakfast is, is being turned on, on, on its head. The idea of, like I said, breakfast cereal, orange juice. Um, you know, and bacon and eggs. Was I like what you say. You say bacon's not bad. Bad, bad bacon, bacon is bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to make a blanket statement that you know all meat is good for you. It, good meat is good for you. I, I, I can tell you that. And the fattier, the better. But uh, if you take the animal you're getting the meat from and then treat it like, you know, like like a sick a- animal and, and allow it to live in filth. Well, I wouldn't want to eat a sick animal. I'd rather eat a happy and healthy animal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's only happy until it gets sacrificed, and then and then we enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that holds true for fish. That holds true for, for a lot of things. So meat is good for you, or I should say good meat is good for you. And then learning yeah. what good meat is is something that we're going to be certainly discussing. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the fields of nutrition, in the fields of fitness, in the field of strength and conditioning, rehabilitation these are all the topics we're going to be talking about Mm. because we need a better education on this i don't we're not going to sit here and teach everyone to become a doctor that's not why you're listening to this show you're listening to this show to become an expert in yourself we want you to become an expert in yourself and when you're an expert in yourself you know what to do Mm -hmm. you have your own reason why you do what what you do and and it's not going to be just because somebody told you to do it um, you know, if you go to the doctor and your cholesterol was 205 and they say, you know, mm-hmm. stop eating bacon. <laughs> yeah. Um, you'll say, all right, I won't eat bacon. But I love bacon, but I won't eat it because my doctor told me to. And That's usually what happens followed by, uh, let me give you a script for this statin drug. Right. By the way. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, it, it's funny because that's a good segue into... I tell everybody this story because it just happened a couple of weeks ago and I take, you know, I went to a doctor's appointment with my mom who's, you know, going to be 92 years old next next week. God bless her. And she's amazing. But, you know, just general stuff, blood pressure and, you know, triglycerides. And she's got an internist that she likes in the Bronx that she wants to go to. And I think it's because he's Cuban and he speaks Spanish. So I, I don't know. But in any event, uh, blood pressure was a little high. And I just sat back and I listened and I thought to myself, this guy hasn't said a word about other factors that affect blood pressure. And I think his intentions are in the right place. But to Steve's point, to Dr. G's point, it's a global situation. It's a global uh, it's 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 a global treatment protocol for everyone, including her. So. I said to him, hey, do you have any nutritional recommendations? Um, And he says, nah, just, you know, just, you know, eat healthy. So I thought to myself, what does that mean? Like, stay out of traffic, you know, eat healthy. (laughs) Um, And uh, so I said, you know, do you have a nutritionist you could recommend? Uh, I mean, I could do it myself. I could refer her to Dr. G, but I'm just kind of feeling him out to see what he says. Now, you know, at her age, if she just eats healthy, you know, she's just got to, you know, make sure to take her medication. So I thought I thought to myself and I told him, I says, you don't have a nutritionist that you work with? He says, no. And I said, do you realize that the importance of nutrition to every single case that comes into your office? He says, yeah, sort of, you know, so. I thought to myself, this is where we're at today. This is 2017, and this is uh, what the average patient has to deal with. And if you're going to a doctor, no matter who he is, it doesn't matter if he's a podiatrist or he's an internist, and there is no component of nutrition within his practice, then he's 15 to 20 years behind the times. That's the way it is. I agree. And and I think one of the problems is if he had a nutritionist, you know, then what would that nutritionist be saying? Um, I, I do know that the highest level of education in, in nutrition as far as certification goes is a clinical dietitian. And um, it's a very tough program to get through. And I know that much of what they're learning is complete nonsense and garbage. Um, I, I mean, I, I can tell you a lot of clinical dietitians work 
in hospitals. And, um, you know, when, when, my, when my dad was, was suffering from cancer and dying of cancer, I, I walked into the hospital room and, uh, you know, he's got his plate in front of him with his meal, his hospital food, and it was basically... Um, you know, chopped up hot, uh, hot dogs and sauerkraut. Oh, yeah. My <laughs> I God. Mean, and, I mean, and margarine. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's com- it's completely out of control. Uh, you know, a, a hospital ha- is going to make decisions based on budgets and, um, you know, what, what they're fed from the FDA. And, and as you said before, there's all kinds of biases and... and um, you know, conflicts of interest there. So we really got to take control of our own health. If you find yourself in the hospital, you know, hooked up to tubes and just hoping that somebody can do something to you, to, then, you know, that's that, that's a bad situation to be in. What we want you guys to do as our listeners is to avoid all that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to thrive. So to some, thrive. So, some people say, you know, hey, how you doing? You know, and somebody say, ah, surviving. I never say that. That's such a New York thing. You know? I'm surviving. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. that's like minimalist. That that that's like surviving is like I'm I'm barely getting by. Right. So our thing is to thrive, right? And and when I say our thing, it, it, it's the, the the people who are interested in what we have to talk about. They want to thrive, and that's why we call the show the Thrivalist Manifesto. That's it. That's our platform, and you know anything regarding human performance that we can communicate to you and research for you and like I said bring it down to a 10,000 foot level for you so that you can on the next day be able to apply it to your life that's the thing how do I apply this right now you know how do I apply uh I want to exercise but I don't know what to do Mm -hmm. and I have two hours a week um and there's so much information out there what do I do? What's important? You know, and we'll try to break that down for you. Even in the in, in something as simple as not as simple as something as common as weight loss. Mm-hmm. You know, just what what ninety five percent of the professionals out there think is completely wrong. Um, if you just ask yourself the question, and uh, the the work of Dr. Jason Fung from Ontario is really amazing on this, where. Ask yourself the question, why are there no reunion episodes of The Biggest Loser? And and it's a show that's been running for, I don't know, 10 years or so. Virtually 100% of them within two years have gained all of their weight back and then some. 100%. Dr. G throwing out daggers on the first episode. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but but th- th- this is reality because here's what we think. We actually think that if we eat less and burn more that we'll lose weight. And it's true. We've all experienced it. You eat less, so that it's, it's math, right? Fewer calories in. If the calories out mm-hmm. in the form of exercise exceed calories taken in in the form of food, well, then you'll lose weight. It's, it's math. Right. You know, the laws of thermodynamics. And that's complete bullshit. Yeah. And it's complete bullshit because that's why everybody gains all of their weight back. Just yesterday, I was watching uh, a documentary. It's only about a half hour long, and I, I want to. I think it's called Weight Gain. I kind. I think I purposely blocked it out of my memory. Uh, but I was watching it with my wife. It's an HBO documentary. Th- one of the very first lines in the documentary is exactly what Dr. G just said. They're talking about thermodynamics. Calories in equals calories out. So now somebody's watching that, and that's complete bullshit. It's totally misinforming them. And so the crux of it was a study that they did that took nine months where they put patients in a hospital and gave them a liquid diet, and they measured their... uh, their body composition and their weight and then they measured how much weight they gained back after they left these controlled environments and whether it had any effect on their so-called set point but people watch this and their interpretation is if they're not educated and this is not their field they're like all i got to do is eat less or all i got to do is go on a liquid diet and that's the premise of that whole biggest loser and it and it can't be more wrong than that yeah, no, The Biggest Loser is based on putting uh, you know, all these people into a hotel room, feeding them 600 calories a day, making them work out like six hours a day, and it's a race to the bottom. And Murdering lose, them. They lose tons of weight. <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, they look great. They, the shows are incredible. And then go visit them in two years and see where they're at. And um, you know, there's nothing to stay. If, if the goal is to, if the goal is to lose weight, you'll do anything to do so, right. regardless of whether or not it's healthy for you. You can get your stomach removed. I mean, you'll lose weight if you get your stomach removed. Does that make you a healthier person? However, if your goal is to get healthier, well, then you'll become the weight that you'll that you're supposed to be. Um, so it, again, it, it kind of comes to the globality issue, right? So, so many of the recommendations that we make can apply to people with traumatic brain injury, weight loss, cancer. Yes, I'm going to say cancer. Uh, chronic infections like Lyme disease or autoimmune diseases, uh, any, any type of immu- chronic immune challenge. Orthopedic injuries. Orthopedic injuries. And, and all of these things are relevant <laughs> because of the physiology of the body. And our understanding of the physiology of the body is no longer based on on understanding who we are and where we came from instead it's based on digging deeper and deeper into a mechanistic view so what we do is we say you know we are uh just a a, a make up the addition of all, all of all our little parts right mm-hmm. but we're actually more than the sum of our parts we function as a whole very differently than we function as a, a co- individual component but dr g is saying is one plus one is not two when it comes to the body one right. plus one is three or five right right and, and then, it's really important to understand you know and 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 know that it's you know the way that our systems are designed now it's everyone is specialized as we said and 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 generally they know what they know mm-hmm. and it's not their fault it's just right. that's what it is right. they know what they're know they know what they know and yeah. and they'll apply that and you know what if you give everyone a hammer and one hammer everything starts looking like a nail mm-hmm. and that's the way that you know the populace at a, as a whole is getting treated you know when it comes to health and performance <laughs> yeah I mean we you, you and I see people all the time who are you know our age you know in their mid to late 40s or, or early 50s or even their in their 60s and they just want to stay active and they, mm-hmm. they they've done well in their life they have time they want to jump out of airplanes they want to climb mountains mm-hmm. but they they, they need a knee replacement or, or, or they, they're waiting on some kind of uh, arthroscopy type of <coughs> surgery for their shoulder or their knee. Mm-hmm. They have chronic back pain. Um, you know, they, they're starting to get forgetful. They, they have a parent that's dying of Alzheimer's. And they, you, you can see the concern and the anxiety in them. Mm-hmm. And so they start seeking a specialist, right? I'm going to go to the neurologist for my brain. I'm going to go to the orthopedist for my knee. I'm going to go to all these diff- different doctors, and the fact is, and we've seen this, we can give a recommendation to somebody that encompasses their their genetics and their health, and you can see things improve across the board. You can see dramatic changes in blood sugar. You can see pain disappear. You can see improvements in cognitive function, the ability to focus and concentrate. And and then they say, oh, what kind of a doctor are you going to that that they can make all the all these things get better? Mm. And I always say, I don't do anything. It's what can I get you to do for yourself? Well, that's funny because I always use the phrase, yeah, who's the best therapist? You're the best therapist. Right. Who's the best doctor? Yeah, you're the best doctor. Right. Not not from a uh, not not from a from a natural or what we call an innate standpoint where Mm. it's built into you. Let the system work and it will. Mm-hmm. But if you put yourself in environments that are just not natural to your genetics, well, then you're not going. You, your your genetics are not going to respond appropriately. Correct. Right. Correct. So we always talk about, uh, you know, there there's this. Some people believe that our understanding of genetics is going to be what conquers diseases like cancer and diabetes, and what we now know and and this is where the research is going um, in basic science not in the pharmaceutical companies but in the basic science is going towards epigenetics you know how does the environment turn on and off different genes and then define the environment what is your nutritional environment what is your light environment what is your 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 sleep. electromagnetic environment <clears throat> what is your sleep environment what is your your emotional spiritual environment mm. who do you who do you hang out with mm-hmm. um, so those are all things that impact your genes and it's again we want to break it down how can I create the best environment so I can enjoy my life today 
we're not if you're how do listening I thrive? yeah how, how do you thrive tomorrow mm-hmm. morning mm-hmm. it's not about i'm doing all these things for my health cuz i want to live to 150 yeah you know what if i do live to 150 i i i don't want to be wearing diapers <laughs> right but but it's how i wake up tomorrow it's how i wake up tomorrow and enjoy my family my kids it's can i can i do a tough mutter can i climb a mountain can i do these things tomorrow right right exactly exactly what i want to thrive and how do i thrive right. and 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 how do i do it on a consistent basis yeah that's the key so ben v i think this was a good first show to kind of give an overview of of where we're going with our um, with, with this podcast, we're going to be doing, we're going to be bringing to the table interviews. We're going to be bringing research. We're going to be talking about books. We're going to review products. We're going to give our experience to, to the listeners, um, the experience. We're going to take the requests from the listeners as mm-hmm. well on topics that they are interested in. Absolutely. So uh, stay tuned for and keep an, an ear open and eye open for our website that's going to be launched and, um, you know, a way to sign up for our, our, our newsletter because... Our goal is to give value and information that you can use. And we appreciate you tuning in. Absolutely. And tell your friends. Tell all your friends. (laughs) 